the cup that contained the tea, contaminated. The seven bar staff at the hotel, who took the cup away, washed it, wiped it, set it out for other guests, contaminated. The pine bar itself, contaminated and still closed, two and a half months on. Safe and sound in Moscow, Lugovoy and Kovtun protested their innocence. We sat at the table and talked for 20 or 30 minutes. I'm completely certain, I'm 100% sure, that he didn't order anything and we didn't offer anything to him. But who might have ordered the assassination? Can the trail of polonium help us with that? So what about the Kremlin? They've got history. This is the Black Lubyanka, the headquarters of the old KGB. Thousands of ordinary people were executed in the basement. The story of Soviet poisoning goes back to the early 20s. This building here is laboratory number 12, the poison factory. The question is, is it still in business? with Charles Leaf was at some point he'll make a decision to kill that woman and child. As our SWAT team started moving up the stairs, they've got their weapons at the ready. A door burst open. Here comes Charles Leaf pushing his way out. He's got the rifle over the top of them, screaming at our agents, get back, get down, get down. I thought I was going to be dead. I thought that was definitely going to happen. When that crack goes off, there's no doubt what it is. I mean, it's not a floorboard cracking or something like that. It is a rifle. Your heart beats so much you can feel it in your throat. They were asking to see if everybody was all right, and he wouldn't let us make a noise. Rising a full three kilometers above sea level, Russia's Alps contain some of the most treacherous peaks in the world. But this untamed wilderness is undergoing a radical transformation. In just two years, the resort town of Sochi will play host to the Winter Olympics. And the Russian government is spending an astonishing 327 billion rubles to transform this mountain valley into the most high-tech winter sports complex in the world. But if a massive avalanche hit these slopes during the games, it could kill hundreds. The best defense is massive gas-powered cannons to trigger small avalanches before snow builds up to critical levels. And only one machine in the world can get these colossal weights to the remote mountaintop locations. Its revolutionary coaxial rotor system was developed in top secret at the height of the Cold War. This ingenious invention makes the Ka-32 the most agile chopper in the world. Crew, Commander Vasily Ischenko. The former army pilot has over 5,000 flying hours to his name. He's one of the most skilled chopper jockeys in Russia. Seven a.m. Today, Vasily's team has to install three avalanche cannons on Krasnaya Polyana's most remote peak, the Black Pyramid. Homes such as here in Manchester, where some elderly men and women living alone behind closed doors are losing the struggle against poverty, poor health and the cold. This is a disgusting state to live, I think. It's very cold in here as well and there's no heating in here either. This is the home of Bill Renshaw, 66, who lived here alone. For a man who's been seriously ill and having to put up with conditions like this, I think it's disgusting. Bill had only one kidney. 
Just before Christmas, he collapsed. This is where they found him, on the settee. Um, obviously, at the time, trying to get warm. This was Bill's only way of getting warm, was this blanket. But in the end, Bill was, he was past getting warm because um, when, the, when the ambulance men came, he was in a coma. And these were the conditions, basically, that he was having to live in while he was a seriously ill man, without heating. To me, as far as I can see, he just had no help at all. Thousands of our elderly have fallen off the government's radar. They suffer alone, discovered only when they have a crisis, when the ambulance is called, or they have died. Welcome to Emirates Stadium, home of Arsenal, one of the latest British institutions to attract the attention of a Russian oligarch. There is a battle going on for control of the club. In 2007, Arsenal was rocked when an elusive Russian billionaire bought a huge stake in the club. His name was Alicia Osmanov. We've come to Moscow to see if we can find further information about Osmanov's past. We met an investigator who spent six months trying to discover details about him. Dispatches has learned that she was hired by a company advising the Arsenal board. She had been to the Uzbek capital Tashkent and tracked down one of Osmanov's jailers. Welcome to Heavy Metal Production, Russian style. This is one of the world's biggest train factories. And these workers have just three days to make a monster locomotive. If they don't, the penalty is simple. They don't get paid. And if that wasn't bad enough, Prime Minister Vladimir Putin is about to inspect the factory. But fights are breaking out. Stop, stop, stop. Workers are being sent home. And lethal errors are stopping production. In just three days, can the Nevs factory pull off a train fit for a prime minister? This is life on the line in the wild, wild east. This is the Mamiroa Reserve, deep in the Brazilian Amazon. Over 22,000 square miles of luxurious rainforest and the widest waterways imaginable. Today I'm setting out with my guide, Elmir, to explore the wildlife and perhaps catch a glimpse of Mamiroa's greatest gem, the white wakari monkey. The reserve boasts 400 species of birds, including these egrets posing on the highest treetops. A little further down river, we disturb a sloth, watched over by a vulture. And then there are the mysterious boto, a river dolphin. And at night, caiman, eyeing up their prey. When the first Spitfire prototype flew on March the 5th, 1936, the short flight would prove a milestone in British aviation history. When the test pilot touched down, he was elated. He immediately told Mitchell and the design team at Supermarine, don't change a thing. This plane was faster and more maneuverable than anything else in the air at the time. It was also lethally beautiful. It's remembered as the savior of Britain, and some of the people who had most respect for it were its enemies. As a point of honor, captured Luftwaffe pilots would always claim they'd been shot down by a Spitfire. We meet Caro to try to discover his desires and motivations, and to try to find out what this surprisingly youthful 80-year-old wants to do next. I feel like Gulliver standing here over 
over Tate Caro. It's a giant one twentieth model of, of, of Tate Britain, and um, and this is how we set out the show and begin to decide where things should go. It's a great way to get a sneak preview. So here we are in the 50s, and then we're moving fairly quickly through into the abstract sculpture, and here we are. Yes, I we're in that, the 60s, the new is, sculpture, already. That, that was 1963, before I went to the States. The shock then, of the new sculpture. Something like that. <laughs> and this is early, early one morning. morning. Um, and that's um, the month of May. That's month of May. How operatic do you think 1984, the novel, is? Well, it's uh, one of those rare 20th century novels that lends itself very well to the operatic form because opera uh, is about larger than life ideas, about larger than life themes, and uh, you don't sing. Uh, uh, at the in opera, at least uh, about anything else, uh, the, the voice is is larger than life, so it's always about extreme situation. The uh, novel uh, cries out to be uh, treated as as an opera. It uh, it is highly dramatic, very concise. Storylines are, are crystal clear, and each personality, each personage is uh, delineated with, with uh, remarkable clarity. The Wizard of Electricity, the Napoleon of the light bulb. Whatever you want to call him, one thing is certain. Thomas Edison has had more influence on our world than any other scientist in history. Many of Edison's inventions sit in our homes a century later in practically the same state as when they left his laboratory. It's an astonishing and unrivaled achievement. No other inventor has left such a lasting legacy and been so prolific. I don't do anything, you know. There's a script. There's sets, there's a light cameraman, uh, there's people that have to, and there's actors primarily. But somebody has to be there to, uh, say, to say go and to say stop. Violence is the most obscene thing. I, I'm, I'm totally against it, but it's there all over the place. How can you ignore it? I made it in, I tried to make it in Natural Born Killers a satiric interpretation, by which I mean it was an over-exaggeration of violence. There was nothing realistic, nothing realistic in that violence. It was Including done, course, used enemy but in as America well. it was looked at literally as violence. You've got this legendary reputation for, for sniffing what's next in the air. What would you say is going to be the next big thing culturally, musically, visually? I, I sort of, I think that what is interesting now is the possibility of a new art form coming about. And I think that will be based on the DVD and it will be something that is um, inseparably visual and musical at the same time. For over 40 years, Robert Crumb has reluctantly played the role of America's best loved underground cartoonist. He's famous for creations such as Fritz the Cat, the Keep On Trucking Guys, Angel Food McSpade, and the crazed guru Mr. Natural, characters that have proved both influential and deeply controversial. For the past decade, Crum has retreated to a tiny village in the south of France. His favorite toys, old records, and memorabilia providing the ideal environment in which to work. What brought you here to France? It's actually, uh, you know, very pleasant. And French people being discreet the way they are, they kind of leave me alone and I leave them alone and it's fine. It's a beautiful place. You're not allowed to mention the name of it, so I don't want, you know, the fans to find me, but it's, it's a nice place to live. Brought all my stuff from America, it's exactly the same stuff I had over there, so I just kind of have my own little world wherever I go.